Welcome back to this course on critical learnings on forest and Adivasi rights. This is part 3 where we explore the convergence of the Forest Rights Act with other laws. In this lecture, we will learn how the FRA engages with the Scheduled Castes and Scheduled Tribes, Prevention of Atrocities Act 1989 or the Atrocities Act to protect the forest dwelling Scheduled Castes and Tribes. The Atrocities Act recognizes the hierarchical and oppressive nature of state and society towards the Dalits or Scheduled Castes and Adivasis or Scheduled Tribes. The Act is geared towards safeguarding the right to substantive equality guaranteed by Articles 14, 15 and 17 of the Constitution and the right to distributive justice guaranteed to marginalized communities such as forest dwellers by Articles 38 and 39. Most crucially, the Atrocities Act puts into practice the state's commitment to protect the right to life and livelihood of these communities, which is guaranteed by Article 21. The Atrocities Act and the case law emerging from it have been focused primarily on upper caste violence against Dalits, but it is important for Adivasis to use this law too. The Atrocities Act seeks accountability for violence against marginalized communities by society at large, by private individuals and also by the state. This accountability is in the form of a criminal proceeding. An atrocity against a person from a Dalit or Adivasi community is therefore a criminal offence, inviting criminal prosecution and penalties. You may ask why oppressed tribes and castes are clubbed together under this act. This is because both categories of communities have shared experiences of marginalization. They have faced various kinds of violence through words and actions at the hands of dominant communities. Due to their shared vulnerability, the struggles of the Dalits movement and the forest rights movement have some common ground to demand protection from structural violence by the state and society. Both Adivasis and Dalits have historically fought against injustice by the forest bureaucracy, commercial interests and large landowners. In this lecture, we will learn about how the Atrocities Act can be utilized by the forest dwelling scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers. In addition to vesting forest rights and creating a mechanism for their recognition, the FRA also creates a new criminal offence. Contravention of any provision of the FRA and its rules by any authority or public official or member of any authority or committee is now a crime under Section 7. What this means is, if an authority contravenes the law, it invites criminal proceedings and punishment. For example, an SDLC rejecting FRA claims en masse because they are not supported by satellite maps or refusing claims of OTFDs on specious grounds is a violation of several provisions of the FRA and also the forest rights rules. Additionally, it is a criminal offence under Section 7 of the Act. The procedure to initiate criminal proceedings under the FRA is given in Section 7 and 8. Punishment for an offence under Section 7 is a monetary fine up to rupees 1000. Section 8 details the process by which offences under the FRA may be brought to the notice of the state-level monitoring committee for action and how the courts may take cognizance of the same. While violations of the FRA are rampant, taking punitive measures under this law alone can be difficult for Adivasi and Dalit forest dwellers due to various structural barriers. This is where the Atrocities Act comes in. The law pertains to atrocities committed by non-SC, non-ST persons against a member of a scheduled caste or scheduled tribe. The Atrocities Act has a list of what is covered under the definition of atrocity, which includes a range of offences, including wrongful dispossession, sexual assault, verbal abuse, blocking right of way to public or community property, and so on. Some of these offences are especially relevant to forest-dwelling Adivasis and Dalits and are listed here on your screen. In 2016, an amendment to the Atrocities Act specifically included Section 31G as an offence, which changed the landscape of the Atrocities Act as far as forest rights are concerned. 
This important provision explicitly includes interference with the forest rights of forest dwellers in its definition of atrocity, which makes it possible to use the Atrocities Act as a protective legislation for forest rights. The pictorial representation on the screen breaks down the key components of Section 31G and where each component of this clause may be applicable. Notice that the clause covers atrocities on IFR and CFR land holdings, community land and water resources, and any obstruction during the collection and sale of minor forest produce by forest dwellers, among other things. In many ways, Section 31G is similar to Section 31F, which relates to wrongful occupation, cultivation or transfer of land. However, Section 31G adds an important dimension to the nature of the offence by directly addressing the manner in which forest dwellers access their resources. As we shall soon learn, both these clauses are particularly relevant in cases where the forest department has taken over forest land for large-scale tree plantations. Section 31F and G use the word wrongfully as in wrongfully occupies or wrongfully dispossesses. The meaning of wrongfully is explained in the Act as follows. Against the person's will, such as where a forest guard stops an Adivasi or Dalit forest dweller from collecting water from the forest, which is a forest right under the FRA, or stops his or her animals from grazing. Without consent, that is, where the person has not given his or her express approval or where the dispossession occurs without his or her knowledge. For example, if forest officials fence off forest land and transfer it to a mining company without knowledge and active consent of the Adivasi or Dalit forest dwellers who enjoy rights over it. With the person's consent, where such consent is obtained by putting this person or any other person they are close to in fear of death or hurt. For instance, if forest officials force members of the Gram Sabha to consent to a mining project on their land in a meeting where large numbers of paramilitary forces are present. Fabricating records of such land, for example, fabricating a Gram Sabha resolution in favour of diversion of forest land can be construed as wrongful dispossession and can be prosecuted as an atrocity. Any other similar wrongful act? By using the word includes at the beginning of the explanation of this clause, it is left open to the judge to include other similar wrongful acts within the scope of the law. In the next part of this lecture, we will be discussing how to use the Atrocities Act to file complaints regarding FRA violations by government officials and private persons. The Atrocities Act stands out because of the stringent punishments under it. For sections 31F and G, conviction can range from a minimum of 6 months imprisonment, extending up to 5 years imprisonment and also a monetary fine. Punishment for convicted government officials is even stricter, with a minimum of 1 year's imprisonment. This is an important aspect of the Atrocities Act as the law takes societal and state violence against Dalits and Adivasis very seriously. Therefore, offences under the Atrocities Act are cognizable, non-bailable and anticipatory bail is also not permitted. This means that the accused can be arrested without warrant and that bail is not a right in such cases. Section 3.2 of the Atrocities Act includes within the ambit of the law many aggravated offences which may be committed specifically with a view to obstructing justice such as hiding or falsifying key evidence in cases pertaining to the property or person of a Dalit or Adivasi. Here too, the law recognises the enormous power public servants and officials have to pervert the course of justice. Therefore, public servants guilty of offences under Section 3.2 shall face more stringent punishment such as life imprisonment or even death penalty. Now we come to a very important aspect of the Atrocities Act. Since an atrocity under this Act is a cognizable offence, the law places a burden on the police to register an FIR and to conduct an investigation. A police officer who refuses 
or fails to register an FIR when an atrocity occurs is himself liable to be charged under Section 4 of the Act, which we shall come to shortly. To remove any doubts regarding the application of the Lalita Kumari judgment to these offences, Section 18A of the Atrocities Act clarifies that registration of an FIR does not require a preliminary inquiry, nor does the investigating officer require any approval from his superior officer to arrest the accused person or persons. Now, under Section 197 CRPC, sanction for prosecution of a public servant is necessary before a court can take cognizance of any criminal offence. This provision applies to offences by public servants under the Atrocities Act as well. This means that sanction for prosecution should be obtained before framing of charge by the court. It is not required at the stage of registering the FIR or for the purpose of arrest or for investigation into the offence. Section 197 CRPC also states that such alleged offences must be committed while acting or purporting to act in the discharge of his official duty by the public servant. You can see on the screen a few examples of offences that do not require prior government sanction for a court to take cognizance of the offence as these acts are not part of the discharge of official duty under any circumstances. It is not part of a government servant's official duty, for example, to set fire to crops, destroy huts, sexually or physically assault forest dwellers, etc. In fact, these actions are included in the definition of atrocity and are punishable by the law. Be that as it may, whatever be the offence, it is absolutely important to remember that nothing stops you from registering the FIR. Section 4 of the Atrocities Act states that any non-SC, non-ST public servant who willfully neglects his or her duties under the Atrocities Act and its rules is punishable with imprisonment. A minimum sentence of six months is provided, which can extend up to one year. Also provided is a non-exhaustive list of the duties referred to here, such as registering an FIR, furnishing copies of the same to the victims, recording statements of the victims and witnesses, conducting the investigation, filing the charge sheet in court within a period of 60 days, and so on. But what do you do if an atrocity takes place and the police refuses to register an FIR? Let's take a look at what steps one can take in such a situation. Here, please remember that under Section 154.3 of the CRPC, you have the right to send your complaint to the superintendent of police in writing by registered post and also by hand, so that the SP may register the FIR and initiate the necessary next steps. You can also use Section 156.3 or Section 200 of the CRPC to file a private complaint before the concerned magistrate. Under these provisions, the magistrate is empowered to direct the police to register an FIR and commence investigation. In case of uncooperative police officials, the magistrate may take it upon himself or herself to conduct the pre-trial proceedings, summon evidence and thereafter issue summons to the accused so that the trial can begin. Just now, we have learnt in brief the procedure to approach the police and the courts for legal remedies under the Atrocities Act. Real life, however, often looks quite different. That's why it becomes important to discuss alternative modes of using the Atrocities Act outside the court system, especially when safeguarding forest rights of forest-dwelling Adivasis and Dalits. Sometimes, the affected community is reluctant or unable to approach the courts and police. In such situations, the following avenues can be explored. 1. While discussing violations, relevant clauses from the Atrocities Act can be incorporated in Gram Sabha resolutions. This can be done as a preemptive strategy as well. Secondly, the Gram Sabha can make a complaint to the State Level Monitoring Committee mentioning the relevant clauses of the Atrocities Act which apply in the particular case of violation. Thirdly, in fifth schedule areas, the Gram Sabha can also send representations to the Governor and the President of India seeking their intervention in line with fifth schedule protection. Similar representations can also be sent to the National and State Commissions for Scheduled Tribes 
the National Human Rights Commission, the Child Rights Commission, the National and State Commissions for Women and other such autonomous and statutory bodies. Fifthly, in case of wrongful dispossession or displacement from forest land, a letter citing the relevant sections of the Atrocities Act, namely Section 31G, must be sent to the Tribal Welfare Department of the State Government. This letter can also be addressed to the Secretary of the Government Department to which the errant public servant belongs, seeking action for misconduct under the relevant service rules. Most importantly, over and above all this, the Atrocities Act gives a moral authority to forest-dwelling Adivasis and Dalits, which is very powerful. From their status as encroachers in the eyes of the law prior to 2006, when FRA was enacted, forest dwellers are now recognized as right holders in the forest. This paradigm shift is crucial as the violation of forest rights has become a criminal offense under the Atrocities Act. Now, it is those who violate the rights of forest dwellers who are criminals in the eyes of the law. So far, we have learned that the Atrocities Act includes many kinds of social and state violence against the forest dwelling scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, ranging from verbal and physical violence to dispossession and destruction of property. We have also learnt that various laws can be used alongside or in conjunction with the Atrocities Act to seek justice and accountability in such cases, such as the Indian Penal Code, the Right to Information Act and of course the Forest Rights Act. To deepen our understanding, we will now look at a real-life case study of the Ku Haritharam project of the Telangana government a tree plantation scheme managed by the state forest department. This case study is an example of one of the most commonly committed atrocities by public officials against forest dwelling Adivasis across India today. It will help us understand how the Atrocities Act and other laws can help the affected communities seek justice and accountability. Soon after the onset of the COVID pandemic in 2020, as part of the Haritaharam project, the Telangana State Forest Department started a tree plantation drive on approximately 200 acres of community land in Satyanarayanapuram village. The community of Koya Adivasi families resisted these efforts, but as a result, about 80 people were beaten up and assaulted by police and forest officials. 50 people from the community were also detained and threatened with preventive detention if they did not sign a statement agreeing not to protest. Like many other Adivasi communities in Telangana, the Koya families are still awaiting approval of their FRA claims. Their village is in a fifth schedule area. Despite that, no Gram Sabha consent was sought for the tree plantation. The forest department insisted that bona fide tribal land is not being touched for Haritharam. Yet under this very project, the forest officials cleared the cotton crops in Satyanarayanpuram, which the Koya forest dwellers had been growing for several decades on their community lands. There are a number of legal violations by forest officials and police in this incident. Let's take a closer look together and see if you can spot them. Firstly, did the forest officials and the police commit any offences that fit the definition of atrocity under the Atrocities Act? Several aspects of the incident indicate a case of wrongful dispossession under Section 31G. The Koya forest dwellers were dispossessed from forest land on which they had historically exercised their rights, including forest rights. They were wrongfully removed without their consent and against their will by means of physical assault, restraint and threat of detention. The wrongful occupation and cultivation of Adivasi land for plantations is also an atrocity under Section 31F of the Atrocities Act. Physical violence against the Adivasis by non-SC, non-ST police and forest officials is also an atrocity under Section 31R and S. Finally, the officials involved in such violent eviction can be prosecuted under Section 3.2 of the Act, which is specially enacted for atrocities by public servants. Another question is, which other laws were violated in the eviction of the Koyas from their community lands? 
Under the FRA and PESA, Gram Sabha consent is mandatory for any afforestation or tree plantation activities on IFR or CFR land according to an MOEF circular dated 30th July 2009. The dispossession of Adivasis from their land before completion of the FRA process is also a violation of Section 4, 5 and Section 7 of the FRA. The forest officials who entered Adivasi lands to conduct the eviction drive can also be booked under various IPC provisions for trespass, destruction of property including agricultural crops, fabrication of records and causing grievous hurt. Carrying out such violent eviction drives without giving due notice and an opportunity to be heard is also illegal under local laws relating to eviction from public property. Finally, and most importantly, the fundamental right to life and liberty, which includes the right to livelihood of the Koya Adivasis, was violated by the Forest Department and the police. That's a long list of laws which have been violated. This case study from Telangana has demonstrated that there will often be many relevant statutes when seeking legal remedies in an atrocity case. Several laws can be used in conjunction with each other to seek justice and accountability. More pointers regarding the effective use of the Atrocities Act are available in the supplementary material with this lecture. Let's summarize what we have learned so far in this lecture. The expanded definition of atrocity in the Atrocities Act refers to the dispossession or interference with the enjoyment of forest rights of Adivasi and Dalit forest dwellers. This includes 1. Violations of the substantive forest rights vested under FRA, including in situations where the rights recognition process is underway or not yet complete, and 2. Violations of due process or procedural rights in the rights recognition process under FRA. This includes not just physical threat or eviction as we have just seen in our case study, but also bureaucratic obstructions placed in the recognition process. Both these protections offered within the ambit of the Atrocities Act are integral to the fundamental right to life and livelihood guaranteed under Article 21 of the Constitution. As we come to the end of this lecture, it is evident that the Atrocities Act offers safeguards for both substantive and procedural rights of forest dwellers. While criminal laws have often been used to target already vulnerable groups, the Atrocities Act presents a different scenario. It offers protection to vulnerable communities from powerful elements by declaring many kinds of violence against them a criminal offence, inviting serious punishment. The Act thus puts into practice the constitutional principle of substantive equality, an important step towards undoing the historical injustice suffered by forest-dwelling communities of India. With this, we conclude our lecture on the intersections and interlinkages between the Forest Rights Act and the SEST Prevention of Atrocities Act. The next lecture will discuss the role of the state in tribal areas by looking closely at laws for food and livelihood security. Thank you for watching.